Hello and welcome to my record room in sunny Los Angeles. Today more gems from the EMI Columbia HMV catalog. What a fantastic label full of wonderful performances from all the most famous musicians captured in beautiful sound. As I've mentioned before, compared to Decca, the sound is a little bit more of a mid-hall perspective than Decca. But these are glorious recordings and I've got some real treats for you today. To begin today, music from the great David Munro. Greatly missed, he died at such an early age. He was an extraordinary performer, communicator, broadcaster, one of the pioneers of the early music movement, the period instrument movement. So many of the great people who really made their mark in that, like Christopher Hogwarts, started out performing with David Munro. And this is one of his earliest records. Music of two Renaissance dance bands. Well, that immediately tells you how much fun this is. We've got music from Suzato, dances from the Dancery, dating from the 1550s. And then we've got music for Broken Consort from Thomas Morley's first book of consort lessons. We've got a fantastic range of instruments in here and a wide range of styles of dances of music. What have we got in terms of instruments? Well, we've got obviously recorders, viols, lute, citterns. Then we've got in the bigger orchestra, cornets, sackbuts, these are sort of early brass instruments, recorders, crumb horns, dalcians, violins, viols, violone, lute, regal and harpsichord, and percussion. We've got percussion everywhere. This is just so much fun. And I'll single out one in particular piece, which was really how I got into this. Again, I think it was in a music history class. My teacher played some of this record, in particular this piece, which is called Pavan la Bataille. And this is a musical representation, one of the earliest, I would imagine, of a battle in music. And you have one army over here, which is one little group of instruments. And then you have another army over here, another group of instruments. They sort of, each army plays their thing and then they come together in this huge splendid racket and noise. This is just too much fun. You can also get this in a very nice uh, CD version on Testament. Testament who do excellent reissues of the EMI catalog. Uh, highly recommended either on vinyl or on CD. You can see this is a slightly different label. Certain EMI labels, uh, they didn't come in just the regular cover and certain ones of them came in this sort of purple color. So that's David Munro and the Early Music Consort of London. slight change of pace now uh, to a piece of music I discovered through this record and I think often we become really attached to the records, the recordings of works, the first recordings that we hear especially when we're younger. Now everyone knows Dvorak's New World Symphony 
but it's only in more recent times, uh, certainly since I was growing up, that some of his other symphonies have become more mainstream. And in particular this one, the Vorjak Seventh Symphony. And this record, when it came out, this is with the wonderful Carlo Maria Giolini playing, I think with the, yes, the London Philharmonic Orchestra, one of my favorite orchestras. And I just love this recording. Now, there are other people who will recommend, you know, they'll say, oh, Kubelik on Deutsche Grammophon, or they'll say Istvan Kurtes on Decca. Yeah, these are great recordings, but there's something about this record. I think this is one of Giolini's very finest recordings. He recorded the symphony again later uh, for Sony, but at that time he was well known for his tempi just slowing down more and more. This one is just perfectly done. And the end of the symphony has this wonderful passage where it sort of, it covers up all the music in the orchestra. It slows down a bit and the brass have this big soaring phrase. And I've heard it done many different ways. Giolini takes his time. He actually slows down a little bit. I couldn't tell you whether or not that's in the score, but it gives it such a sense of nobility and a sense of just bringing it to a glorious, noble conclusion. And it's still my favorite version of that end and really of the whole symphony. And I think this is recorded, yes, <laughs> the classic team of Christopher Bishop and Christopher Parker, who really, they did so many of the great EMI recordings of the 60s and 70s. You just can't go wrong with them. Look at this, it's a beautiful cover. I think this was reissued on Testament and you might still be able to find that version of it, but also just a regular EMI postage stamp uh, copy from when it was released, which is what this is. Uh, that'll do you fine too. Ah, now to another classic, 
Uh, I've had this record since, I don't know, when I was 11 or 12 or whatever. When was it released? It was actually released in 68. Four is Requiem, performed by the choir of King's College, Cambridge. This is such a classic recording conducted by their longtime music director, David Wilcox. And you've got wonderful soloists, John uh, Carroll Case, baritone, and Robert Chilcott does the, the treble solo beautifully. This is such a, a lovely work. It's much gentler than the other famous settings of a Requiem, for example, Berlioz or Verdi, which are sort of storming the heavens and very operatic. This is a much more soothing, it's much more about conveying a sense of comfort and repose in, in the face of death. It's a beautiful piece. Now, the Requiem exists in a number of different versions. And I highly recommend exploring some of those other versions uh, with a smaller orchestra, etc. Um, but this version, which is for many years was the standard version, is with a regular orchestra. This has long been considered one of the classic King's College recordings. And it is beautifully captured, not actually recorded in King's College Chapel itself. It's recorded in the Chapel of Trinity College probably because it's a less resonant acoustic. The vast acoustic of King's College is very hard to master. And that's probably why they moved it, because they knew they had a full orchestra to record as well. But this is still, for many, their favorite version of the Requiem. It's certainly probably my favorite version. There's just something about it. And as an extra, you have the orchestral version of the Pavan, a beautiful piece. I know this was reissued on the High Q reissue label. High Q did a whole series of EMI record reissues. Now, they did the mastering all analog and they did the pressings on 180 gram vinyl, as is the general uh, habit of these reissue companies. Unfortunately, the quality of the vinyl itself varies massively on these high Q reissues. And it's a case of you just have to take your chances and see what you can do. I've got quite a few of them. I like having them because uh, the mastering is good. They've restored a certain amount of extra bass, which is always nice. And I just put up with the ticks and pops where I have to put up with them. Some pressings are better than others. There's no golden rule. You just have to give it a go. You can often find them at a cut price on the usual sites and also certainly via Discogs and eBay. You shouldn't have to pay too much, but you can also just go with a regular uh, pressing from the time like this one. It's from the, this is a reissue from the 70s, but it sounds great.
Now it seems like every time I do one of these videos about EMI releases, I end up doing a, an Andre Previn record, but it's hard not to. They're all so good, they're so well recorded, and just full of treasures, and sometimes where you least expect them. And here is one of those. His recording of Mahler's Fourth Symphony. Some of you may go, I never knew that Andre Previn recorded Mahler. Well, no, this is not so well known, but I think it's a really fine performance. It goes without saying it's a fine recording. I'm guessing, oh, well, this is actually, because it's later, 1979, it's one of the great producers uh, at EMI, Suvi Raj Group, and then the balance engineer is Michael Sheedy. Now, interesting, this is not with the London Symphony Orchestra. This comes from later on, and it's with the Pittsburgh Orchestra. Now, I love Mahler's Fourth Symphony. It's long been one of my favorites. It is, for many people, the most accessible of his symphonies. It's shorter, it's lighter. I find it an absolutely delightful piece. I have certain favorite recordings. I still love the first recording I had of it, uh, which was Raphael Kubelik's on Deutsche Grammophon. I'm also very fond of the Claudio Abado recording on Deutsche Grammophon with the Vienna Philharmonic with Frederica von Stader singing the solo part in the last movement. That's a very special record to me. And actually my original vinyl is a very, very good pressing. It sounds great. But I recently discovered this. Uh, again, it was in the used bins. I bought it on a whim and I was surprised to find this is really good. Uh, he takes it in some ways a little slower than some other recordings. There's a real sense of uh, empathy for Mahler's idiom from Previn. I think one of the things that's remarkable about Previn was that he could perform so much different or orchestral music so well. I mean, he just had a huge range and it was always good. I had considered getting hold of the new um, EMI giant box of all his uh, recordings they put together, I think, in 2021. Unfortunately, nearly all of those, I don't think, if not all of them, have not been remastered. And so well, I didn't really think there was any point. And I have so many of these on vinyl. You pretty much cannot go wrong with Previn's EMI records on vinyl. They're just fantastic. And there are odd little gems throughout his catalogue. Uh, for example, the record he did of Mozart piano concertos with Adrian Bolt. Absolutely lovely. And this is also one of them. Highly recommended.
Okay, now the big guns. Otto Klemperer, one of the giants of 20th century conducting, and certainly one of the main conductors on EMI, dating back to his re recordings in the 50s, uh, wonderful recordings. This is, I think, one of his very best records, and that is Mahler's Resurrection Symphony. This is one of my favorite Mahler symphonies. I featured it in uh, my CBS uh, video and talked about Bernstein's recording in Ely Cathedral. This is such a titanic performance. Now, I would love to be able to show you an original pressing of this. It's something that I've long wanted, but it's very hard to find. And if you find it in decent condition, it's going to cost you a fortune. I also severely covered, actually now I covered it even more, there was a recent re-release of it on the Electric Recording Company. That's one of these real boutique reissue companies. They only do something like 300 pressings of their releases. They do really well-selected uh, classical sets, as well as some jazz and some pop. Uh, they recently did this, I think, to buy it brand new was something like three, uh, Three hundred dollars a record, so that's six hundred dollars. Uh, sold out within minutes. They master all their stuff on hand rebuilt equipment, beautifully done artwork, sleeves, everything done to the max. My God, I would love to own this in that version, but <laughs> alas, I cannot. So I will settle for my copy on a seventies reissue. This is the version that you will find most readily avoid any digitally remastered versions on on record all of those are to be avoided like the plague this sounds really really good uh it, of course it lacks that extra bit of magic you would have with a tube mastered version but it doesn't matter this is a titanic performance and i love to listen to this alongside i, I love my old Schulte recording on decker his first one i also really like uh, the meta performance and obviously the Bernstein performance. But there is something really special about this. And for anyone who likes Mahler, who hasn't discovered this, this you have to get. It is one of the classics of the gramophone. And in conclusion, something a little bit lighter. This record up here. So here we have one of the few records that Leonard Bernstein made for EMI. Now we mostly associate him with uh, Columbia, CBS, uh, early in his career, and then in his later career, Deutsche Grammophon, where he recorded mainly with Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. But scattered in there are a few records that he did for EMI, and this is one of the choice ones. This is so much fun. This is music of Darius Mio. Now, Mio was part of a group called Les Cis. Uh, this was in France in the 20th century. It was a sort of group of composers. Honegger was one of them. Uh, Auric, who you may know as he wrote the music for Cocteau's film of uh, The Beauty and the Beast, La Belle et la Bête. And in fact, Cocteau was the one, Jean Cocteau, the famous poet and impresario and all those things. He was the one who kind of drew this group together. Anyway, these are performances of a couple of his different ballets. Now, Mio was really interesting character. And he was very interested in what, for want of a better word, we would call world music. Now, this goes back to him going to America in the 20s, uh, where he went to Harlem and heard jazz for the first time and was absolutely captivated by it. So when an opportunity came along for a commission uh, some years later, this was for a ballet that was going to depict the creation of a world, but the creation of a world as told in African myth. And he thought, oh yeah, I can use my knowledge of jazz and I can try and integrate jazz into the classical idiom. Well, it worked brilliantly. It scored for an orchestra which includes elements of a jazz band and it just works superbly. And of course, Leonard Bernstein, he's the perfect conductor for this kind of music. It's just wonderful. This is my favorite recording of La Création du Monde. It's done pretty well on disc, but this one is very special to me.
So the other main work we have on here is the music for the ballet, the Boeuf sur le Toit. Now, this had a somewhat unusual origins. Uh, Mio had spent time in Brazil uh, working uh, in a sort of clerical function and had absorbed a lot of the music and absolutely loved it and had sort of strung a bunch of music together uh, that he had composed in this style. And what happened was that uh, Cocteau came along and decided to turn the whole thing into a ballet. He just basically appropriated the music. I'm not sure how much he even consulted with Mio and put this thing together. And it became this typical of Les Cis, this rather irreverent cocking a snook at the establishment. A succès de scandale, as they say, uh, made Mio famous, but he wasn't too happy about it. It's very light, airy. The music doesn't really develop very much, uh, but it's just perfect fun. This is one of a series of records that Bernstein made with the Orchestre Nationale de France. Uh, he also did a recording of the Symphonie Fantastique, which I like very much. It just shows him in a different element, in a different arena. Of course, he's the perfect person to conduct this kind of music. He's absolutely perfect for it. Uh, Création du Monde, I mean, <laughs> with his jazz background and everything, I mean, who else is going to do it as well as, as him? So here you have a wonderful record and also with some extra dance music, uh, also influenced by Brazilian music, uh, Saudade do Brasil, Four Dances. Uh, this is easily found. Uh, you shouldn't have to pay very much money for it. And it's absolutely delightful. So that's it for our selection of records from the EMI Columbia HMV catalog. Full of wonderful stuff. I hope you have discovered a few things you didn't know about, maybe been reacquainted with some records uh, that you haven't listened to for a while. Whatever, it's always great to have your comments, your likes. Uh, if you are watching many of these videos, do go ahead and subscribe. Until next time and lots of wonderful records, I bid you all a fond adieu and happy listening.